We are now at question 9 of this CXC CSEC May 2014 General Paper 2 exam video solution. And question 9a gives us these two functions g of x equals 4x plus 3 and f of x is a rational function. It is equal to 2x plus 7 divided by x plus 1. And the first part here wants us to find the value of x for which f of x is undefined. Now this is f of x. f of x is a rational function. That is, it is a function divided by another function. And a rational function will become undefined when the function in the denominator becomes equal to zero. That is because we cannot divide by zero. A number divided by zero is undefined. And so this rational function f of x will become undefined when the expression in the denominator becomes equal to zero. And let's show that. And so f of x is undefined when x plus 1, the expression in the denominator of f of x, becomes equal to 0. And that gives us x equals minus 1. And so f of x is undefined when x is equal to minus 1. And just to explain this a bit further, let us look at the proof of what f of minus 1 would be. f of minus 1 would be equal to 2 times minus 1 plus 7 divided by minus 1 plus 1. This is when x is equal to minus 1. And this is obtained simply by substituting minus 1 in the f function here. And if we calculate the values here, we see 2 times minus 1 is minus 2 here, plus 7, that gives us 5. And on the denominator, negative 1 plus 1 is 0. And so this reduces to 5 divided by 0. And if we use our calculator to try to evaluate 5 divided by 0, the calculator will give us an error message. And that is represented by the infinity sign. Because 0 can be removed from 5 an infinite number of times. And an infinite number of times is considered an undefined quantity. And therefore, f of minus 1 is undefined. So f of x is undefined when x is equal to minus 1. Part 2 now wants us to evaluate g of f of 5. Now g of f of 5 can also be written as g of f of 5. And so we have to calculate f of 5 first. Now f of 5 is obtained simply by substituting 5 for x in the f of x function here. And this is the calculation for f of 5. That is, 2 times 5 plus 7 from here, 2 times x becomes 2 times 5 plus 7, and x plus 1 becomes 5 plus 1. And when we do this calculation inside the bracket here, that reduces to 17 divided by 6. And we are therefore now calculating g of 17 divided by 6. Now g of 17 divided by 6 is obtained by substituting 17 over 6 for the x value in the g function here. So let's show that. And this is it. When 17 divided by 6 is substituted for x in the g function, the result is 4 times 17 divided by 6 plus 3 because we have replaced the x here with 17 divided by 6. And this now can be simplified by dividing 2 out of the 4 here and also dividing 2 out of 6. When we divide 2 out of 4, the result is 2. And then we divide 2 out of 6, the result is 3. And since this will become a fraction with 3 on the denominator, we can convert this 3 into a fraction with 3 on the denominator by multiplying this 3 by 3 divided by 3. And that is it. And so, when we carry out this calculation, this is result. The 2 times 17 here becomes 34. The 3 on the denominator comes back here. 3 times 3 becomes 9, and we have 3 in the denominator here. This 9 divided by 3 is the same as the 3 that was here before. And we did this just to have 3 on the denominator of both fractions, because when we add fractions, we want the denominators to be the same. Now that the denominators are the same, we can complete this calculation by adding the values on the numerator and put back the common denominator of 3. And when we do that, this is the result. 34 plus 9 
is equal to 43 and the common denominator is 3 and so this is the result g of f of 5 is equal to 43 divided by 3 let's move down to part 3 now part 3 wants us to find the inverse function f to the minus 1 of x that is the inverse of f of x and f to the minus 1 of x is the function that maps the range of f of x back onto the domain of f of x and therefore the calculation of f to the minus 1 of x is obtained by interchanging the representation of the range of f of x with the representation of the domain of f of x the range of f of x is represented by f of x here and the domain of f of x is represented by x and so let's go through this calculation now firstly we're going to write this f of x function as this f equals 2x plus 7 divided by x plus 1 it's the same function but we have left off the notation of x here and so it is the same function and we do this so as not to confuse this notation of the function of x with the x's here that represent the domain of f of x and so when we form the inverse function the range of the function here becomes the domain of the inverse function and the domain of the function here becomes the range of the inverse function and the range of the inverse function is represented by f to the minus 1 and we need to now transpose this function to make f to the minus 1 the subject when we have f to the minus 1 as a subject we can write it as f to the minus 1 of x so let's go through the steps now firstly we want to get this term out of the denominator and to do that we can mark it as one term by putting brackets on it and to get it out of the denominator what we can do is multiply both sides by the expression in the denominator and this is it we multiply this side by f to the minus 1 plus 1 and also multiply this side of the equation by f to the minus 1 plus 1 now this expression here will cancel this expression and that is it and then this side of the equation can be expanded by multiplying x by f to the minus 1 and also multiplying x by 1 and when we do that this is the result and a simple way of looking at the transposition of this equation to this equation is to say we multiply this denominator over onto this side and when we multiply this denominator over onto this side we multiply each of these two terms by x and therefore x multiplied by f to the minus 1 gives us x times f to the minus 1 here and x multiplied by 1 gives us x here and then the term in the numerator comes back here now we want to make f to the minus 1 the subject and so we need to group the terms in f to the minus 1 on the left hand side of the equation and so to do that we can say we subtract 2 times f to the minus 1 from both sides and this is it and this negative 2 times f to the minus 1 will cancel this 2 times f to the minus 1 so let's show that and this is the result after we subtract 2 times f to the minus 1 from both sides next we want to get rid of this plus x from this side of the equation so we can do that by subtracting x from both sides of the equation so let's show that and this is it we are subtracting x on this side and we are also subtracting x on this side now this negative x will cancel this positive x so let's show that and this will be the result of our transposition so let's show that and then show a more simplified version so this is the result of that transposition and a simpler way of looking at the transposition here is to say this 2 times f to the minus 1 comes over onto this side of the equation to become negative 2 times f to the minus 1 and this positive x comes over onto this side of the equation to become negative x now that we have the terms in f to the minus 1 on this side of the equation we can factorize the f to the minus 1 terms out of these two terms and this is it when we factorize f to the minus 1 out of these two terms we are left with x minus 2 in the bracket and to make f to the minus 1 the subject now all we need to do is divide both sides of this equation by x minus 2 and so that's it we are dividing both sides by x minus 2 and when we do that this is the result the x minus 2 here 
We'll cancel the x minus 2 here and the final result of that is this. f to the minus 1 will be equal to 7 minus x divided by x minus 2. But a simpler way of viewing the transposition from this equation to this equation is to say we take the x minus 2 and divide it under the 7 minus x. And that's a simpler way of looking at this transposition. In any case, this is the result. Now that we have f to the minus 1 as the subject, we can put back the notation to suggest that f to the minus 1 is a function of x and this is it. And so this is our f to the minus 1 of x, our inverse function. And that's the answer for that part of the question. And let's move down now to question 9b. Now question 9b gives us this table and it shows the height of a ball above the ground after the ball was thrown vertically upwards. And so at t equals 0, the ball is on the ground. After one second, the ball is at a height of 50 meters. After two seconds, the ball is at a height of 80 meters. After three seconds, the ball is at a height of 90 meters. After four seconds, the ball is at a height of 80 meters. And so it's coming back down. And after five seconds, the ball is at a height of 50 meters. And after six seconds, the ball is at a height of 0 meters, meaning that the ball is back on the ground. And the first part of this question wants us to draw a graph to show the height of the ball during the 6 second period. And the scale we are to use is this. On the x-axis, we are to use 2 centimeters to represent 1 second. So we are putting time on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we are to use 1 centimeter to represent a height of 10 meters. And so, let's show the grid for our graph. And this is it. Time will be placed on the x-axis and the scale is 2 centimeters to 1 second. The height of the ball will be placed on the vertical axis and the scale is 1 centimeter to 10 meters. And to draw the graph, we need to identify the set of ordered pairs that we'll need to plot. And we are going to be plotting the set of ordered pairs consisting of the time and the height of the ball. And from the table, these are our ordered pairs. 0, 0 is for this point. When the time was 1, the height was 50, and that is this point. Then we have 280, and that's this point. Then we have 390, and that's that point. Then we have 480, and that's that point. Then we have 550, that point. And then we have 6, 0, and that's that point. And so we were plotting these points on the graph. And let's show those points. And this is it. This point is 0, 0. This point is 150. This point is 280. This point is 390. This point is 480 for here. This point is 550. And this point is 6, 0. And now that we have our points in place, all we need to do is draw a smooth curve to the points. And this is it. And that is our graph showing the height of the ball during the 6 seconds. And this graph is a distance time graph because it shows the distance above the ground against the time of flight. Let's move down now to part 2. Now what we have is the distance time graph for the height of the ball t seconds after it is thrown vertically. That's a distance time graph. And we must recall that if we want speed from a distance time graph, we have to calculate gradient. Gradient on a distance time graph is speed. And therefore, if we want the speed at any instant on this graph, we have to calculate the gradient. So if we want the speed of the ball at this instant, we would have to calculate the gradient at this point. And because we have a curve, the gradient of a curve is changing from point to point. And the gradient of a curve at this point would be equal to the gradient of a tangent at this point. If you want to know the speed of the ball when t equals 4, that is at this point, we would have to calculate the gradient of a curve at this point. And the gradient of a curve at this point would be equal to the gradient of a tangent to the curve at this point. But let's proceed to the questions. Now the first part wants us to use the graph 
to calculate the average speed during the first two seconds. And remember, if we want speed, we have to calculate a gradient. Now, the average speed during the first two seconds is the constant speed at which the ball would have to travel to cover the same distance that it did in the two seconds. And if you look at the graph, this section of the graph of the two seconds represents the flight of the ball during the first two seconds. And so from the graph, we see that the height attained over the first two seconds is 80 meters. But the speed of the ball was not constant and we see that because this section of the graph is a curve. And so the average speed of the ball during this first two seconds would be represented by a straight line from this point to the point where t is equal to 2. And that straight line is called a chord. And so this straight line represents the average speed of the ball during the first two seconds. And since we want the speed, we have to calculate the gradient. And so the gradient of this chord represents the average speed of the ball during the first two seconds. If the ball traveled along this chord, it will be traveling at a constant speed and would attain a height of 80 meters over the same two seconds. And so the gradient of this chord represents the average speed of the ball over the first two seconds. And therefore, this is it. We want the gradient of the chord. And the gradient of this chord is simply the rise over the run. The rise is 80 and the run is 2. And so the gradient of a chord is equal to 80 divided by 2 and that reduces to 40 meters per second. Part B now wants us to calculate the speed of the ball when t is equal to 3. That is the speed of the ball at the instant when t is equal to 3. Now if you look at the graph, t is equal to 3 at this point. This point is the maximum point on this graph and is the instant at which the ball is at its maximum height. And as I suggested before, if we want the speed at this point, we have to calculate the gradient of a curve at this point. And to get a gradient of a curve at this point, we need the tangent of the curve at this point. And so we would have to draw the tangent at this point. And at this point, the tangent is horizontal and the gradient of a horizontal line is zero. And therefore, the speed of the ball at this point where t is equal to 3 is equal to the gradient of this tangent. And the gradient of this tangent is zero because this tangent is a horizontal line. And so the speed at t equals 3 is equal to the gradient of the tangent and the gradient of the tangent is 0. And that's the answer for that part. Now it is not far-fetched that the speed of the ball at the maximum height is equal to 0. Because if we think of throwing a ball vertically upwards, that ball must stop instantaneously at its maximum height before it can return to the ground. And so it is easy to appreciate the fact that the speed of the ball is equal to zero when the ball is at its maximum height. If we throw a ball vertically upwards, it will slow down before it reaches its maximum height and then at its maximum height, it will come to instantaneous rest and then it will turn and start coming back down and as it comes back down, its speed will increase again. And therefore, this result is quite understandable. But generally speaking, speed is a rate of change that can be obtained from a distance time graph by calculating gradient. And there are several other rates of change that can be obtained from a quantity time graph. Average rate of change is rate of change over an interval of time and the gradient of a chord over that interval of time will give the average rate of change. And actual rate of change is rate of change at an instant and the gradient of a tangent at that instant will give actual rate of change and therefore average rate of change over an interval on a quantity time graph suggests that we need the gradient of a chord over that interval but actual rate of change at an instant on a quantity time graph suggests that we need the gradient of a tangent at that instant on the quantity time graph. And that is why for this question, the average speed was calculated using the gradient of a chord, 
but here the actual speed at t equals 3 was calculated using the gradient of a tangent and that's the end of part 2 of question 9b and that's the end of question 9 and we'll do question 10 in the next video see you then